Salisbury Cathedral much of yesterday. So back to our Lady of Liberty today. And um, I made some very important adjustments to this painting yesterday evening. And sorry I did it without your watching, without your permission. <laughs> um, you can go back and watch day before yesterday if you like. That would be Daily Art Adventure 283, I believe, where I began this painting. And uh, the last time you saw it, the last time it was posted, it was much greener and much brighter than this. So last night, one of the last things I did before I left my studio is I did a glaze, dark, strong glazes. Not This was not a time for timidity. <laughs> I did some very strong glazes over the entire painting last night, and I'm happy to say that the painting very much uh, came to life as I uh, did those glazes. So, yahoo, I went to bed a happier man because this painting really took a, a good turn. I'm doing a, just a little bit of correcting, corrective drawing right now, cor corrective painting. And uh, I penciled out some of these changes again last night before I, before I left the studio for the last time. There we go. That's better. And uh, I don't know if this might be a good place to talk about a very specific subject. Yeah, it is. Let's zero, zip, zero in here. Okay, now it's, it's better than it was, but let me try to point out something. And this is what I call, <clears throat> I don't, there's not a perfect word for it. I call coterminous, sorry, big word, coterminous shapes or kissing edges. Either one means the same thing. Easy to explain, difficult to use exact terminology. Here it is. When I came into my room, the studio the other day, the dark part of her chin ends right here. Can you see that, right? Like here's the light and here's the dark. So there's a line right there. It just so happens that the last spike coming out of her head, the bottom part of it lines up perfectly with that edge. That's, that's what I call co-terminus. That is, they terminate in the same spot, the light of her chin and, and the shape of this uh, light spike, spike in her head terminate at the same line. Very bad. You do not want things like that happening in your painting because it's confusing to the viewer. It's troubling to the viewer <laughs> what shall i say so i need to fix that so it's either i need to move the the spike down or move her chin up and as i look at again for the you know umpteenth time as i look at the photograph which i have right here at the top of my easel just out of out of range for you there um i see that i can actually raise up the dark of her chin just a little bit and now I fixed that, what I call coterminous problem. Does that make does that make sense? I hope it does. It, it, this kind of thing comes up in every kind of art, every, every every kind of subject matter, and it's a very easy mistake, if you will, if you want to call it that. It's a very easy thing that to to have accidentally happen, and uh, many times the artist doesn't see it because the artist is focused on so many other things that it just like it did here, it just escaped me till I came back in the room and saw the, the painting with fresh eyes. I'm still working on that side. So first I did a dark value and I'm coming back with a slightly lighter, this, this green um, that I have throughout much of the painting. It's, it's, it's a secondary highlight color. That is to say it's where um, this this green shows up where the the statue is in shade but it's being hit by reflected light this wonderful 
turquoise-ish color shows up. It's one of the things that uh, attracted me to this photograph, I'm sure. So I need little bits of it here and there, a little bit of drawing here and there, just to finish this painting. Uh, once I, last night, once I got this glaze on it, by the way, so the, the glaze made it much, it was a blue and green, pale blue and pale, pale blue and pale green painting. That's a slight exaggeration, but to a large extent, it was blue and green. And the glazes that I put on it last night, listen to this, were yellow, orange, red, rose, and violet, from purple to yellow. In other words, I had green and blue. All the glazes I put on top of it were at the opposite end of the color wheel, opposite end of the color spectrum from green and blue. And in other words, I, dirt, I warmed it up a bunch and I dirtied it up a whole bunch. And happy to say, it, the painting came alive when I, this sounds I ironic, doesn't it? Painting came alive when I dirtied up the colors. And uh, I don't know how accurate, you know, we're, you're getting a bit of a glare here. If I go like this, you can see a little bit more accurately what the colors are. But uh, again, the painting came alive when I dirtied the colors. Boy, that's a good lesson for somebody. I, I do that fairly frequently, I, I think it's fair to say. Um, not only did I dirty the colors, but I switched the warm cool. It was a very cool painting, and I, did a, I did a, applied a whole bunch of very warm glazes to the very warm painting. And again, the painting came alive. I went to, to slither, literally, <laughs> went to sleep last night going, oh, thank God that, that Statue of Liberty painting has really turned a corner. It was that dramatic. I, and I wish I could have shown it to you, but it was, I'd already done enough broadcasting yesterday. And uh, it, it only took a few minutes, but it was very, very critical couple of minutes. I am, as you may know, I'm a huge believer in transparent, the power and the magic of transparent color. A, a, a magic that is, was largely lost in the painting of the 20th century. That's a long story. Why was it lost? How was it lost? Uh, I'm not, I've gone into it in the past, and I will in the future. I just don't want to do it right now. Um, very briefly, in the 20th century, we were learning the lesson that painters were painting paintings, not pictures. Because the, I guess I'm getting into it in spite of myself, aren't I? Okay, in the, in, the, uh, in the 19th century, the camera was invented. Excuse me, I'm looking for some, some green paint over here. In the 19th century, the camera, of course, was invented. And artists, painters, to a large extent, lost their identity. Because before... Uh, Here's a, a color I bought as an experiment. Michael Harding's, by the way, Michael Harding, fantastic paint, really. Permanent green light. So I, I uh, haven't used it very much. It's almost exactly the color that I need to do this, this the, the secondary light on this shadow, secondary light on this statue. Um, so in the, in the 19th century, with the invention of the camera, um, painters lost their job because for centuries, maybe millennia, for centuries at least before the invention of the camera, artists, painters, were the camera, right? But now all of a sudden they lost their idea, they lost their role in society. And so a huge part of the turmoil of the 20th century, not all of it by any means, there was a whole lot of other tumultuous things going on, but part of the turmoil was artists trying to rediscover, so what are we doing here? And uh, I think one of the best lessons we learned in the 20th century was that artists are not painting p 
pictures, and I, I, as you know, I usually kind of a smart aleck streak in me. I like to mispronounce, mispronunciate the word. <laughs> um, pictures. So artists are not primarily involved with painting pictures. We are primarily involved with painting painting. So a big part of that lesson was learning that the canvas was not a three-dimensional magic window, but the canvas was in fact flat. So learning the canvas was flat uh, was paramount in the movements of the 20th century. And because of that, we lost much of the magic of transparent painting. I wonder if, can I stick this somewhere? I think I can. Yeah, that's dry. Okay. I want to do just a little bit more work on this, on her mouth. Again, last night before, I did a glaze over the whole painting, and then I did just a tiny bit of pencil lines that I'm using this morning to help me make slight, slight adjustments or slight corrections, one could say, to her face. And I think, I think when I finish these little adjustments, I, I think I'll be happy with her face. Um, she's just a little bit poochy lipped right there. Let me, <laughs> poochy lipped, let me diminish that, that mark slightly. Okay. Now I'm ready to do maybe, perhaps, I think the very last thing on this painting, which is just a few of the highlights on her face. Now, I want to be very careful because I love the patina, the texture that's already there on her face. And I don't want to violate that too much. I think it's already going a very good direction. Uh, and it, again, it's very much improved last night when I did those dirty, warm glazes on top of the what was what was a cleaner color at the time. So I've mixed up here yellow ochre, permanent green light, and titanium white. In other words, I've got a light, a very pale, dirty green on my brushes. By the way, just a, just a word to perhaps those of you who are students. Um, when I describe the menu, if I can use that word, the, the, the combination of colors that I use to, to get a particular color, um, I see sometimes on my own comments in my own videos and often uh, in other artists' videos, um, students are, are sort of clamoring to know, no, wait, 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 what was, give me that again, give me that. Especially when it comes to like flesh tones, you know. Tell, wait, wait, tell me again, what did, what did you use to get that color? And if you're a student, let me, let me, give me your ear, your heart just for a second and say, no, 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 don't do that. Uh, just get the vague, vague, vaguest notion <laughs> of what a, what a color r recipe is. But don't try to follow it slavishly. What I recommend is that you just experiment. Figure out your own. Don't, don't follow somebody else's. Use your eye. Trust your eyes. You know, if you've got, let's stick with the idea of, of flesh tones for a minute. If you've got a flesh tone on your palette, but it's a little too yellow, well, then add some anti-yellow to it, which might be purple or might be brown. Um, if it's too brown, then you need to maybe add some red or yellow to it and so on and so forth. So just use your own intuition. Don't get too hung up. I, I, I hear students doing that too often. And um, what is going to teach you how to mix colors is mixing colors, not, not, not taking a shortcut by learning uh, somebody else's recipe. And I don't have a recipe. I don't have a formula. I mix up different colors all the time. Just using your eyes. Trust your eyes. Mix your colors with your eyes. There you go. Mix your colors with your eyes, not with your hand.
Now, I reserve the right, <laughs> I use that term a lot here, I reserve the right to take a rag or a dry brush, and anything that I'm putting on right now, I can take it off if I so choose, if I think I've done too much, and, and I may be doing that. She looks a little poochy lipped I'm not sure. So that, that's, that, that is not a technical term, which means I don't know technically exactly how to fix it. There, that's a little better. That's a little better. Now, a little bit up here. Want to be careful not to uh, use too much of my right hand. Anytime I find myself using a lot of right hand, I have good reason to get nervous. It means I'm probably, um, I'm getting tight, I'm, I'm bogging down a little bit. Anytime. So let me stand back and look at that. Um, not bad. Again, still a little <laughs> poochy lipped, which I think it may be this mark right here. Let me take that down a little bit. Uh, and diminish the power of that edge right there. Oh, I think I know what it is. It's this line is too high. Whoa! Wrong brush. Wrong color on the brush. Sorry to yell in your ear like that. <laughs> Those things happen, don't they? When you put the wrong color on your palette. I forgot that I'd mixed up that color. Let me put that brush down. Okay, now it's, again, just a little bit of this same pale, uh, pale, dirty green. Very pale and slightly dirty green. Don't want it too bright at all. In fact, I do. I can't. I'm not able to get rid of that one, that bad stroke that I put down that had the wrong color on it. There, I've just wiped it off now. Let me come back here and see if I can clean that up. Okay, I'm just about boring you to tears, so it's maybe time for me to take a little break. Uh, I'll probably come back one more time with one more short broadcast where I just do finishing touches on this. On this Statue of Liberty, and then I'll move on. Move back to uh, Salisbury Cathedral painting, if that's all right with you. Well, even if it's not all right with you, right? <laughs> Who am I kidding? <laughs> if I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to do what I think I should do, whether you're in favor of it or not. Just being honest here. <laughs> Okay, let me zoom out, let you take just a quick final look at that. And uh, thanks for watching. Leave your comments and your questions. I'll be back in just a few minutes. By the way, I probably, yes, I'm probably going to offer this painting for sale. I will, I will countenance, I will consider any offers over $500. So if you really like, it's a 20 by 30 inch painting creative painting of the Statue of Liberty. If you'd like, like it, make an offer. Of course, you can offer less than that if you want. You never know. Sometime I might take it. But that's, that's my guess. I probably won't let it go for less than 500. Okay. Thanks so much for watching. Again, I'll be back. Creative painting of the Statue of Liberty. If you'd like, like it, make an offer. Of course, you can offer less. 
Hello friends, welcome back. So I'm here just to do the finishing touches on my Statue of Liberty painting. Let me zoom in there. And the finishing touches in this case is sort of the, the opposite, if you will, of traditional, much traditional oil painting. Uh, much traditional oil painting, you paint, you, you paint the furthermost object first, which in a landscape is always the sky. And here I am doing the sky dead last. Now I want to be very, very delicate with this treatment. So I've got a, 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 a rather medium dull blue on my brushes to start out with. So it's not very bright. And I'm applying it very lightly. Scumbling, one could call this. Scumbling is applying opaque paint in a very thin manner. It's a very translucent. There is some confusion among people. It's a language issue. It's not an art problem. It's a linguistic problem. Some people just not gifted at language. That's all right. Nobody's, every, nobody's everybody, a friend of mine used to say. Um, but there's some confusion about the, the, the words, uh, transparent versus translucent. Translucent is fuzzy like a frosted light bulb, or like a frosted, frosted window pane. Do, 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 do. Frosted window pane is translucent. You can see through it, but it, it, there's color. Anyway, <laughs> just coming out of the Christmas season brought that little snippet of a holiday season song to mind. So I'm doing very, very, very translucent. Just kissing it. Um, if you follow me much, you've heard me talk about, and if you haven't, if you don't follow me much, continue to do so, please. Please hit subscribe. And um, I talk a lot about the dance of painting. Big steps, little step, little steps, big steps. Light steps, dark steps, literal steps, and artsy or expressive steps. All of those interplaying with transparent, translucent, and opaque. And between those three, transparent, translucent, and opaque, the magic, more often than anything, the magic is in the translucent layer. Did I emphasize that strongly enough? <laughs> Translucent. <laughs> can you say that a little more strongly, Mr. Nelson? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I can, but let's not, okay? So I am uh, doing translucent here very definitely. Trans translucent painting creates a fascinating patina uh, if done rightly. It makes it look as though the painting took you know, weeks and weeks to, to do, to, it, it just as the, the layers of color build up and, and makes it look very rich. Patina is the best word. By the way, the, I was looking for the word a while ago, verdigris, which is what happens to copper, right? When it, the color of the Statue of Liberty is very verdigris. <laughs> Definitely verdigris. Okay, now, I better think about what I'm doing here. Is that a good idea? <laughs> when, when you're painting, it behooves one to think about what one is doing? Yeah, um, I, because I dare not do too much of this blue. Um, uh, subtle is, is so often a better strategy than bludgeoning. <laughs> than, so I just want a hint of blue. I don't need to, you know, I don't need to tell anybody that the sky on planet Earth is blue. That, a, that on a clear day, I don't need to tell anybody that, you know, on a clear day, the sky behind the Statue of Liberty was blue. We know that. So it's not like I need to explain that. I just want to give enough of a hint so that the viewer will go, oh, yeah, of course, blue sky, but not, not get clobbered by it. I'm going to come back here with a slightly lighter. Have you heard that mantra? It's almost always a good idea to come back and put a slightly, slightly lighter color 
on top of the color you just put down. If it's a color you put over a, lot er a large area, then it's a good idea to come back and do a slightly lighter version of that color over bits of what you just put down. We don't generally, we, the viewers, the art the viewers of painting, generally speaking, we don't like to see that an artist took a brush full of this or that or this or that color and, and can I use the word, plastered it, plastered it all over the place. Generally speaking, we do not like to see that. That's an unpleasant sensation. Now, at the same time, as an artist, it usually is a good idea if we put a little bit, say, of blue somewhere in the painting, it's a good idea to put blue, red, green, and so forth somewhere else in the painting. So those two things need to be held in tension with, with each other. One does not negate the other, just they, they are uh, both true principles held in tension. Okay, I'm going to do just a little bit down here, and I'm going to move the painting just over a little bit, and a little bit down here, and I think that I'll be done with Miss Liberty. Now, I tell you, I had enough fun doing this painting that I am toying with the idea of doing another one, either exactly the same view, because there were s certain things that I wanted to happen in this painting that I didn't quite succeed in, in creating. Isn't that funny? I'm happy enough with this painting, but I, I have a vision for something else that could have happened. And uh, so I, I'm sort of inclined to try it again. Um, I thought I had a fan brush here, but I don't, so I'll use a, a little chip brush to, that's called diminishing texture there. Okay, I think I'm done. Let me go around the edge here with this pale blue. I paint the edges of my canvas so that I don't have to buy frames and put on frames. Oh, I hate spending money on frames and I hate putting frames on so I always just do what is called a gallery wrap and um, I don't have to mess with frames and the the buyers can put a frame on if they want to but most people these days are actually not who buy paintings are not putting frames on them at all just for what it's worth if you want to know I'm gonna bring some of this blue into the statue a little bit here Okay, now again, I'm, I'm going to be like the, the bad preacher says, just one more point. <laughs> I keep thinking I'm just about done, then I just see a little bit. I think I want some blue up here. I will put, I think I'm finished. I will post a photograph of this painting on YouTube. And if you like it, if you want to make an, I'm going to make a slight change here. I'll do that without you guys watching. If you'd like to make an offer on the painting, feel free to do that. Otherwise, it'll be at one of my galleries. Thanks so much for watching. I'll probably be broadcasting a new topic later on today.